Sean, sorry for the delay, but uh, no, we finally set this all up, and thank you so much for uh, coming out here today. How are you doing today? No, I'm doing I'm doing great. Thanks for coming out, Brandon. Appreciate uh, it. Well, I know uh, you're a busy guy. I know this is like our, your third show already today. Yeah, it's been a fun day already, so you, good stuff. You're, you're a busy guy, though. I mean, people are interested in um, – you know, the carnivore diet. I and mean, that's really how I heard about you from Travis Statham in New York. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating how this, not even a new idea has really kicked in and people have really jumped on board to what or why people could just want to eat, not just red meat, but, uh, you know, mostly animal-based products. And I really, the first thing I wanted to uh, ask you, because this is something you really talk about and really hammer home first, and where I want to start the show is like, what is a diet? How would you define a diet? And what, what do people know as a diet? Yeah, so the way I consider uh, a carnivore diet is basically an animal-based diet where we focus on animal-based nutrition and then we either completely eliminate or significantly limit plants in an effort to improve our health. And so this is in direct contrast to what we've been doing for you know, the last 10,000 years where plants have dominated the diet and the results have been pretty intriguing. It's interesting when people look back and see where, you know, or why we eat the, eat the things we do and eat the way we do. And, you know, there was a big jump for us as humans from that uh, boom in like 8,000 years ago to say, hey, we don't have to worry about food anymore. And, I mean, doing that kind of gave us civilization. It gave us the, the freedom and availability in our lives to make science, politics, religion, culture. Um, you know, it, it had its benefits. And is, is, it, is it at a time where it's like just weighed out now? Is it something that we need to push on towards? Or is it something that is a choice for humans that we have all the freedom to make? Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we basically ran out of our food supply. I mean, that's, that's what really happened. That's why agriculture, the, agriculture was born. I mean, we lived in a time for, if we consider human beings have been on the planet about 3 million years, uh, you know, starting out as, you know, arguably Homo habilis and then progressing through Homo erectus and then eventually Homo sapiens. Uh, we lived in a, in a, in a world where we, we had, you know, millions and billions of huge megafauna animals. And that was our primary source of food. As we became more prolific as a species, we ended up basically eating our food supply. And then when that dwindled and we lost the, the great megafauna about 25 you know, around beginning about 50,000 years ago and then, and then kind of culminating around 20,000 years ago, uh, we had to look for alternative sources of, of food. And so that's what we did. And so we, we adopted agriculture out of necessity. And as a result of that, humans as a species became uh, smaller, about six inches smaller. Our brain shrunk about 200 cc's. Our dentition became poor. Uh, our bone structure was, was weaker. Our muscle attachments were weaker. Uh, and sure, we were able to support larger numbers of population, you know, by exploiting, uh, you know, grains and other agricultural products. But the ultimate result was uh, just a degradation of the overall health of the population, uh, despite the fact that civilization has flourished and we've been able to do wonderful technological things. We are still, on average, less healthy than we used to be. Interesting. And for real quick, I know. You could define what megafauna is. I know woolly mammoth would be one, but even for me, I, what was some other animals? Yeah, that so fall in most that people will define a megafauna typically as an animal that I think is in excess of a hundred pounds or a hundred kilos. I'm not sure. I can't remember the cutoff on that. But if we look at, uh, you know, the beginning of the Pleistocene, which started about 125,000 years ago, and they've done some pretty good research. Felisa Smith out of the University of New Mexico has done this research. And they estimate the average size of a mammal, you know, 125,000 years ago, it was about 500 kilograms. That was the average size. You know, if we take all the animals and kind of line them up and then take their average weight, it would be about 500 kilograms. And we compare that to today, the average size of an animal is about seven kilograms. And mm -hmm. so we've gone literally two orders of magnitude smaller in the amount of animal material we've had available to us. And that ratio comparable just to having more people? And just less resources and everything kind of shrinking Well, well yeah, I mean, humans preferentially sought out bigger animals just because they were a better source of nutrition. You think about it, if your technology was basically, you know, basically a spear and you had to get food and, you know, you could, you could try to gather, you know, 15 million raspberries or, you know, you could hunt some small, very quickly moving antelope or you had a slow moving animal that has lots of calories that doesn't run away. I mean, the choice was pretty obvious and humans clearly did that. It's, it's very clearly seen that humans are very proficient at killing, you know, things like elephants. You know, when Africans hunt them, one or two guys can kill an elephant with ease. And so Homo erectus discovered this about 1.5 million years ago. And they did that just continuously and basically until they ran out. Yeah. And even like the... 
the mammoths, how much bigger were they? A lot of people don't have an idea because they don't exist today, but how much bigger they were than even you know, an Af- ele- African elephant? Yeah, I mean, they, they would dwarf an African elephant. I mean, they were, they were even much, much bigger than that. So you would think, you know, and humans usually clustered in, in tribes of about, or, or groups of about 10 to 20 people, and they would take down a, an elephant that weigh, or a mammoth that might weigh 18,000 pounds, and they could eat for three or four months, five months, and they'd have to make one kill, and that was it. And the mammoths were everywhere. So it was very plausible that, you know, that's all they had to do. Mm-hmm. And that's even interesting to today. You know, you're talking about if we were to farm, you'll say 15 million raspberries. But even like, you know, if you would buy a whole cow or a whole pig, you're still probably getting more beneficial nutrients out of like a whole entire animal than you would be getting out of, you know, even plant-based food. Right. I mean, you know, if you think about it, everything that you as an animal needs to function, all the nutrition you need is also found in another animal. I mean, you think about all the nutrition, all the nutrients. There are, you know, only a few things that human beings need that are absolutely essential to our survival that we have to eat. We have to get essential amino acids, essential fats, vitamins and minerals. All of them, every single one of them is contained within an animal. And they're also, not only are they contained in there, they're contained in the ideal ratios. You know, if you think about it, what does it take to build human tissue it's, or animal tissue? It's just more animal tissue. That's the ideal uh, sort of uh, nutritional scheme. So when you go on a plant-based diet, it's, it becomes more challenging. It's very uh, sort of more difficult to, to, to sort of cobble together the nutrition you need to make it work plants have a lot of what's called anti-nutrients. Uh, they have a lot of uh, things, they have a lot of uh, nutrients that are not in the correct form that humans need. And so we have to try to convert those and we don't do that necessarily very efficiently. And some people are better at it than others. I think vitamin A was a big one that you can get in animal-based nutri- n- nutrients, but in the uh, other nutrients. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. So we can talk a little bit about vitamin A. So vitamin A in the plant-based form is known as beta carotene. So we hear about that, you know, carrots, you eat vitamin A, it'll help your eyes. I hate carrots. Yeah, carrots are not the best. And, and, and interestingly, <laughs> though, if we look at wild carrots, what ca- carrots would have looked like 30, 40,000 years ago, they were all fiber. I mean, there was very little starch in those. So it would be very unlikely that humans would have selected carrots as a major source of nutrition. How much starch does it have compared to today? And like, where does that starch come from? Is that gen- genetically Well, it's, gen- it's basically been genetically, you know, we basically selectively bred those. You know, mm-hmm. we find, you know, this is how we do it with plants. We just breed them up and up and up until we get enough generations in where they're producing more. So we select out for the starch producing ones. So, but yeah, the, the beta carotene in, uh, humans is not the form of vitamin A that we actually use. We use something called retinol. And so there's a conversion that has to occur. And the rate of conversion in many people's is very poor. Some people it's only 10%. And so you have to eat basically potentially 10 times as much. And this is the thing with plant foods, you may have to eat higher and higher amounts to get the same amount of nutrition that you would if you, if you got it in the equivalent source of an animal. And so it's not that uh, the problem is a lot of people make the argument based on calories alone. And, it, you know, we can feed the, the most calorie uh, efficient way to feed human beings if we only talk about calories is basically sugar. Sugar is the most calorie efficient crop that we can grow. Now we all know that we just can't sit there and live on sugar. Uh, it's got a lot of problems with that. Inflammation will kill you. Yeah, inflammation will get you in a lot of other things. And so <laughs> when we when we really look at nutrition and we look at things that are essential, and particularly things like uh, certain amino acids like leucine and others, uh, we can get that so much more readily in an animal-based product, whereas with a plant-based product you'd have to eat tremendously more amounts of food to do the same thing. Hmm. What are you on with this? The um, carrot. Now I wanted to, wanted to throw a crux in there too because like it's, it's crazy for me to think because like, you know, we're living longer than ever statistically. Right. You know, maybe looks wise, we're not looking our healthiest. You know, people are dying from, you know, heart disease. Heart disease is the number one killer in our country at least. Is it, is it in the rest of the world as well? Or, I mean, Western well, world, we'll call it? Well, Western world, yeah, heart, uh, heart disease, cardiovascular disease and cancer are the top two killers. Uh, but when we talk about longevity, I mean, really, uh, you know, human lifespan has really not been expanded much. Now, overall population averages are different, but, I mean, you, there are people that lived into their 80s and 90s, you know, 500 years ago. I mean, so we really haven't significantly extended the human lifespan. Now, what we do is we have more people that are, wealthier that can afford access to nutrition, that have access to clean water, that have access to healthcare in general. That's really driven the, uh, you know, the increase in overall population. So back in the 
you know, if you were a, a king, you know, living 600 years ago, you might make it to 70 or 80. If you're a peasant, you know, 30 or 40, and you're lucky, right? So, um, you know, it's not that human lifespan has been extended really any at, at all at this point. You know, there, even, even some of the uh, Paleolithic remains show that it's very likely that some of those people lived into their 70s and 80s. You know, we often hear that, uh, you know, cavemen died in their 30s. Well, that's not true at all. Uh, a lot, their, their, their average population, it might be because so many of their infants died. You know, if one out of two of your babies dies before it reaches age five, which mm -hmm. is likely what happened, then your population average drops tremendously. And so, uh, you know, improving infant mortality rates and, you know, access to wealth has, has made the big difference. Mm -hmm. What about the, I mean, it, just, it, it, it seems like it's just an abundance of resources. Like we're just consuming way too much. And, you know, we talk about longevity, we talk about uh, meal restrictions and, you know, just not consuming as many calories or consuming more, if we're talking about the macronutrients, more fat rather than the protein and carbohydrates. And that's going to be more beneficial for that body over time. And is it just because we, like you said, we can go get all these different kind of quick carbs and starches everywhere that are around us, that that is the thing that's put, it's not, that's limiting us from our expansion into that, you know, more of a, uh, hmm. What were we talking about just now? The uh, age expanding of uh, the overall age expansion. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that are driving disease, and basically, you know, death is just the accumulation of disease. I mean, you, I mean, it's aging is basically disease as it accumulates, and so probably, you know, almost certainly, you know, we eat too much and too frequently. I mean, I think that is a significant, you know, driver of this. And you know, you're absolutely correct. We have just a proliferation. Uh, you know, of food everywhere, and it's not even food in a lot of cases. It's, it's you know, a, a concoction of chemicals uh, that we, we sort of craft together to, to be very tasty and very palatable and, mm -hmm. and provide, you know, a decent amount of calories, but ultimately not much nutrition. And so, you know, probably uh, humans were designed to eat infrequently, like, like uh, you know, many other animals that eat an omnivorous or a carnivorous diet. You know, they might eat once or twice a day at most, and I think that's probably how we were designed. We now, on average, most people are eating, you know, constantly for 16 hours a day. I mean, it's, 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 it's meal followed by snack, followed by snack, followed by meal. And that, you know, it continues to occur, and we're told by, you know, the powers that be, so to speak, that we need to keep our blood glucose up, and we need to be constantly ready to have, have, have energy. And so instead of producing our own glucose, which you can as long as you have sufficient fat and protein in the diet, we now have the glucose fed to us, which is what we don't need to do. Mm -hmm. So we'll always have that glucose level because isn't one like people go more of on the food restriction or eating a higher fat diet, they're going to be put into a state of ketosis where the body's per, the main power source is going to be ketones or at least the fuel source is going to be ketones when all that food hits the liver and starts regenerating in. Will you still have a certain amount of glucose that's created or a certain amount of glucose that the body is creating itself? Yeah, so there's something called gluconeogenesis where the body will make typically amino acids and sometimes the glycerol portion of a fat molecule uh, into glucose. And so we can make plenty of blood glucose. We, in fact, gluconeogenesis is something that's a demand-driven process. And so uh, it's interesting. If you exercise and you don't eat, your glucose level will go up because your body needs more glucose at that time and therefore your body makes it. So we have a robust capacity to make glucose. Glucose is still a very important part of our human physiology. You know, we need to have some of it for our brain. We need to have some of it for uh, red blood cells and certain other cells in the body like the re uh, renal medulla and, and some of the testicular cells. So we need to have glucose. Our body very, very well regulates how to make it, but you don't need to, to eat carbohydrates to get that. And yes, as you restrict carbohydrates in your diet, you will produce more ketones, you will produce uh, arguably more free fatty acids, and, but there's always a combination of those things going on that we use. We just kind of shift the, the relative proportions that we use, but glucose is not an issue. Uh, if you don't ingest carbohydrates, you'll still have uh, you know the appropriate level of blood glucose you need to run things. Hmm, I didn't even know that, because I figured it was just once you rid of it, you got rid of it. No, your blood glucose will, will be still very, very significant. You well, know, yeah, that's one of the blood yeah. tests. I mean, I advise people because, you know, I ask you what's keto, what's carnivore. Like, listen, before you were going to, you know, switch up your body's um, primarily fuel source or, you know, what you've been putting in your body, go to your doctor, get your uh, yearly physical and get your blood markers checked from the resting glucose, blood glucose, your cholesterol levels, your lipid levels, 
um, HDL, LDL, because I think people want to hear about this stuff. They get really interested and fascinating with it, but they don't know how or why, what this could potentially do to their bodies. Well, I mean, I think if we want to, we want to keep the, if we want to continue to talk about glucose, I mean, you know, I think some of the more compelling information is coming out for people that have access to something called a continuous glucose monitor, which will show you what your glucose is throughout the day for 24 hours a day. And that's probably more compelling. You know, is that like on a, a switch or like a, some, you, well, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, thing that's uh, you know, attached to your skin. It, it has a little sensor that goes just below the skin and it can, yeah. it can constantly monitor what your blood glucose is. And so, that uh, is is giving us some really neat information with regard to what diet does to glucose, and so uh, you know you have to have a doctor's prescription to get one of those. So that's one of the one of the downfalls of that. But that really is going to tell you what's going on with your glucose uh, dynamics, and and some of these one-off blood tests. Unfortunately, you know the problem with one of the problems I have with with blood tests in general, particularly the the, the you know you go in and get your blood drawn is that it only reflects what's going on at that particular second in time. And so we have to realize that a lot of these blood values fluctuate quite a bit throughout the day. Things like vitamin D, for instance. If you get your vitamin D drawn early in the morning, it'll be 30% lower than you do it if you have it in the afternoon in a lot of cases. And so we, we, we can't get too attached to these, these particular numbers. Uh, we have to put them in the, in, you know, in the context of the big picture. And so there's other things that I think are more valuable to measure ultimately. Okay. Well, let's get back to the animal-based nutrition and carnivore diet, because um, I'm always interested. Because you're you're a massive athlete, you know. I've seen some of your videos of you competing and working out and training, and I know a lot of people will say like, "Hey, how can you just only eat meat?" Or maybe maybe you do. Are you eating other animal-based products? You know, if if I were to characterize my diet today, it's about I'd say 97 percent red meat. I probably have fish in there, you know, once a month or something like that. I'll have a few eggs every once in a while, a little bit of dairy. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty fair to say I I pretty much pretty much just red meat for the most part. And why do you add the eggs or the uh, the milk or the well, fish just, in there? Just because I feel like it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, this isn't this isn't some sort of religion for me. I just yeah. I just eat because I enjoy it, and sometimes those things have, you know are appealing to me, and sometimes they're not. I honestly feel the best when I'm strictly on red meat, to be honest. I mean, sometimes I'll eat those other things just because, you know, they're, I'm cooking for somebody else or they're available or something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, when I, when I won the world championships in indoor rowing this year, for the two months prior to that, I, I was just very particular to make sure I ate nothing but red meat. I didn't have an egg, didn't have anything. I didn't have any fish, any dairy, none of that, just to, just to prove the point that I could still, you know, win world championships on a, on a purely red meat based diet. So how far is that rowing thing? Is so that was a 500 meter race. You know, it was, it was a, it was a, you know, kind of a, uh, it takes about a minute, about a minute, 20 minute, 15, something like that. And so I ended up winning my division by about six seconds. So I beat everybody by a mile and then I beat a number of, really? uh, yeah, I beat a number wow. of, I beat a number of Olympic athletes in their 20s that were competing, and I'm, you know, in my 50s. And so I would have, I came close to winning the whole, th the entire thing. Would have, you know, would have beaten the guy that won it was a six foot ten Olympian from uh, the Ukraine, I believe. I think he's Ukrainian. And, Sounds like uh, a massive individual. Big guy. Yeah, just yeah. like the basketball guys. You know, big, big, big people going. <laughs> guy was giving me yeah. a concussion before, probably. Right. I yeah, played sure. out there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh man, awesome! So, what is it like a and like a post workout meal? Or like, what's a meal look like on a car? Is it literally just getting you know a sixteen ounce ribeye steak? Or are you put you know a pound of that? Or are you putting two pounds of that down? Yeah. So for me, so I'm you know I'm six five two fifty. Um, I I eat about four pounds of meat a day, and it's usually usually over two meals ninety five percent of the time. So it'll be I get up, have a couple steaks for breakfast, maybe two pounds for breakfast, and then another two pounds for an early dinner, and that's pretty much that's my day almost every day you know with with rare exception and you know it may seem very monotonous and boring but at the same time i i really and i look forward to every meal i'm you know when i think about it i'm literally salivating think it's going to be good because i like it every time and so and it's very i don't have to think about it i don't have to worry about it i don't have to stress and you know plan about you know meals and when i eat them i just eat when i'm hungry and it's mm -hmm. it's it's just a very intuitive, simple way of eating it. It's kind of like just any other wild animal would do. I mean, you know, you don't, animals don't have menus. They're not sitting there with <laughs> macro calc calculators. They're not, you know, fretting about what they eat. They just go and eat. And when, and when do they eat? They eat when they're hungry. And, and, you know, and hopefully they can, if they're a carnivore, they can catch and kill an animal. If they're, if they're an herbivore, they just eat grass till they're full and then they yeah. stop. And, and it works very well. They don't get diseases. And so I think that's how humans, 
again, humans are animals just like any other species, and we should be able to eat a diet where we don't have to stress about it and we don't have to plan and, you know, and, and, and worry. And I think this is the simplicity of that. And I think, you know, I think the evidence strongly points to the fact that humans are something called facultative carnivores. And so there's obligate, obligate carnivores like cats where they must eat meat or they die, where humans... Uh, the, the facultative carnivore term means that humans thrive on a meat-based diet. They can still survive, you know, on plants, but they really do well, you know, as facultative carnivores. Yeah, I think that's interesting when people try to project their, you know, vegetarian or vegan diets onto their cats and their cats start dying or they just get very ill and very sick. Um, and then uh, we're we going into right there. We're talking about the... Uh, I'll put that marker right there. I love how you said so nonchalantly about you know, just eating, you know, two pounds of meat, just four pounds of meat in a day because, you know, the, the meal prepping thing is just seems like a, so much on top. And when you actually weigh it out numbers wise, because I try to be a carnivore for a while, usually trying to eat primarily a ketogenic diet. Um, it actually seemed cheaper. I was spending less money and like you said, less time on going to get my food, cooking my food, preparing my food. And like you said, spending less time on my budget in my pocket because I mean you think about it people are really really eating vegan or vegetarian costs a lot of money yeah I mean I think I think to do a nutritionally complete or, or as close as you possibly get with a vegan diet it's going to be very expensive for for many people particularly with regard to supplements um, a meat-based diet can be extremely cheap I mean you know particularly if you you know don't have to emphasize you know, organic or, or grass finished type products. And you don't, you, you, you honestly, you don't need to do that. I mean, for some people, and there are reasons to, to support that. And I, I certainly agree with uh, supporting regenerative agriculture. Um, but yeah, it can be very cheap. I mean, some people do this diet on ground beef and I mean, they literally spend $3 a day, which is, you know, by US standards, that's extremely e economical from a diet standpoint. And really, uh, you know, we have a, a poverty, some, some poverty issues and some health issues, particularly in the, in the impoverished populations. And they could literally solve that problem with, with cheap ground beef. I mean, you, you could literally, uh, you know, make some big headway, you know, if, if we just did that. But that's, that's, too, that's pretty contra controversial for many yeah. people. I mean, especially with how much we're importing now from Brazil itself. I mean, most of the beef is coming from outside the country. Well, it's I mean, getting cheaper too. Well, I mean, the Brazilian beef, that's, that's not completely accurate. Brazil we, we, represents about a half a percent of our imports. Really? Uh, yeah, it's a very small amount. Uh, more of our beef will come from Mexico, Canada, and then Australia. But we still, the lion's share of our beef comes from uh, the U.S. itself. I mean, we domestically produce and consume most most of our beef. And the, the, one of the things that, uh, unfortunately, there used to be something called a country of origin labeling law uh, that was repealed in 2016, uh, where we had to label where the beef came from. So now they are allowed to sort of mix meat from all over the world in one package and say, you know, it's product of the USA, which is not quite accurate. Is that a good thing or bad thing? Uh, I would argue it's a bad thing, and so would most of the producers. They feel that, that we should know where our food comes from, and I agree with them. No, it's interesting because the food laws and food labeling is just so touchy, especially when you start talking about like produce. And does it have GMOs? People want GMOs. If it has this or not this, it's organic. Organic actually doesn't really mean anything on the label anymore either. So what you're getting is, you know... God knows what's been sprayed on it or been labeled on it or how much stuff has to have a certain kind of seed that's coming from, what is it? It's not even Monsanto anymore. Bear, Bear Medical owns Monsanto. So whatever they deem that you're gonna, they're going to spray or put in those seeds is something you're probably going to be ingesting. But I think a big thing I want to go back on, because I get in this debate with people a lot, it's about the grain-fed versus grass-fed and how that also affects other animal products such as dairy and the butters and the milks because... Again, budget-wise, yeah, if I can get that grain-fed stuff and compared to the grass-fed, how much is it actually going to be detrimental to my omega-6 to omega-3 you know, ratios? Because I'll get people getting on my profile and my stories and trying to tutor me and teach me. I'm like, you're not paying for the Kerrygold. I, don't, I, don't, I can't afford Kerrygold right now. Let me get the regular Land O'Lakes. I'll be happy. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting because there are people that have done, you know, personal studies on that. Uh, one gal I know in particular her named Sylvia Tavor, and she actually did that study. She did a month of purely grass-finished beef and a month of grain-finished beef, and her omega-6 to omega-3 ratios 
were almost the same. There's very little difference in that. In fact, um, while gr you know grass finished beef has some uh, elements in in it that are considered better, conjugated linoleic acid, zinc content, uh, vitamin E content. Uh, you know, and some others that people would say, well, that's, that's a little more nutritious. At the end of the day, both of them are extremely healthy products relative to just about anything else you can buy in a supermarket. And so if your budget dictates that you can only afford grain finished, then I would say certainly go with that option because it's going to be something you can actually, I don't care how nutritious something is. If you can't afford to eat it, its nutritional value is zero to you. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to, to, to make this realistic. And so, and in all honesty, the majority of people that have done this carnivore diet, the longest that people have done it, 10, 15, 20 years, they just eat grain-finished animals. I mean, and they're doing wonderfully. I mean, they're extremely healthy. Um, I think that there are some people out there that will feel, feel better with a, uh, you know, a grass-finished product. There, I mean, there are those people. There are some people who feel better, including organ meats in their diet. There's a big kind of push to eat nose to tail, and I, and I get that. Uh, but I don't think it's absolutely required for everyone to do that. And I think you have to kind of figure it out for yourself. I mean, when we think about it, if we look at a cow, you know, a cow's carcass is about 500 pounds after it's been dressed, you know, actually deboned. And, and we look at that, and then we look at what a liver weighs. A liver from a cow is about 10 pounds. And so we've got 10 pounds versus 500 pounds. Where do you think most people would have gotten their nutrition from? You know, there's people out there advocating eating liver every day. I'm like, that's just not realistic based on the animal. I mean, animals aren't. You know, they're not 50% liver by volume. They're, they're 1 to 2, 3% at most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was that, like 2% right there? We're talking about 10% of the 500-pound animal? Right, yes, yeah, so it's yeah. about 2%, yeah, 2 to 3%, something like that, yeah. Unreal. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a huge, huge, big debacle. And, uh, no, I'm glad, because uh, you think about it, like, I think if you've mentioned this before, I've wrote, listened to you say this, just uh, whatever that cow's been eating, you know, it's something whether it's been grass or grain, and you're going to be taking on those nutrients that the, the animal is taking on right there not going to be a negative that's going to be coming in back into your system. Well, I mean, we look what animals do for us. I mean, you know, if, if I were to, you know, try and graze on plants or, you know, if I already, you know, humans, technically humans can eat grass. I mean, we can get some nutrition from it. The problem is it's high in silicates and it's extremely upsetting to our stomach. And so we'll have a lot of gastrointestinal stress with that. But if we were to sit there and compare, like a lot of people like to use gorillas as a comparison or chimpanzees, <laughs> look how big gorillas are. Well, gorillas literally spend 85% of their waking hours physically chewing. That's all they do all day long is they chew constantly to be able to, to get enough nutrition. And so cows and other ruminant animals and other herbivores basically do all the chewing for us. They concentrate all those nutrients in one beautifully, uh, perfectly nutritionally balanced package called meat that we can now access and eat and we don't have to chew anymore. You know, if we look at the, uh, the anthropologic data, early humans or, or, or yeah, early, early humans would spend about 4% of their time chewing. Whereas a chimpanzee is spending 65% of its time chewing and a gorilla 85% of its time chewing. So if we look at what, what was the difference there, it's because humans had access to a very nutrient dense, nutritious, high calorically valuable source of nutrition, which is basically, you know, animal meat and particularly fatty animal meat. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go over some pros and cons of the carnivore diet because I know I've seen a lot of pros. I've, I've been trying to research and see what the cons were. I know pros are, and I wanted to ask you why uh, the carnivore diet has such an interesting effect on people with autoimmune diseases in, in a positive way because they've had, either have a hard time um, eating certain diets or just anything just just not working with them at all, but eating, you know, that steak once or twice a day and they're just feeling better. And some people, I mean, I think I've seen photos of people uh, sent things to you. They've been eating steak for 20 years only. And some of these women, I mean, they're 46, but they look 19 or 22. It's, it's just remarkable. Yeah. So, I mean, at this point, obviously, uh, until we can get robust clinical trials done on this, you know, we have to look at the plausible mechanisms. With regard to autoimmune disease, there's some good inter interesting research coming out of uh, Boston from a fellow by the name of uh, Alessio Fazzano. And he's done a lot of research showing that likely autoimmune diseases are a consequence of something called leaky gut syndrome. So leaky gut syndrome refers to the fact that our digestive tract is lined with cells and those cells are held kind of side by side and, 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 and things aren't allowed to get past them very easily. And so when, when you're exposed to certain 
things in the diet, it can disrupt those junctions. And so the cells then open up and then all sorts of things get in that aren't supposed to get in. And that causes a, an immune response, which we see as affected as autoimmunity. And so I think that's probably the main possible plausible mechanism is why so many people are seeing r r relief for autoimmune disease. And we know that there is data out there showing that a meat-based diet tends to restore the gut permeability to, to where it's supposed to be normally. And, and certain foods disrupt that. And some of the things that are particularly problematic at erupting, interrupting that are things like seed oils. So that's what we see, like the canola oil and the soybean oil and the corn oil and the I mean, sunflower. It's on everything. It's they, in they, everything. It's in all it the processed salads in right. restaurants. It's, it's too. in everything. And they cook, they cook in it in the restaurants. It's in all the processed foods. It's in all the, you know, just about everywhere. So and we, we, we didn't even used to have that in the human diet until about 120 years ago when we started figuring out how to, what to do with cottonseed oil. Before it was just an industrial lubricant. We had no use for it. And then a German uh, scientist figured out how to hydrogenate or partially hydrogenate it. And then it became a substitute for lard. And then Crisco was invented. And then Procter & Gamble lobbied the American Heart Association in the 1920s. They gave them a million dollars to say, let's promote our Crisco. And so it's been in the American diet ever since then, or the world diet, really, at this point. And so now, if we look at, like, food consumption in the United States, soybean oil calorically pro provides as many calories for people today as beef does. So people are eating just as much soybean oil as beef, which is, which is crazy. And so we see that thing. We also think, see things like... Uh, Certain grains can disrupt the gastrointestinal barriers, things like uh, certain nightshade vegetables, dairy can have an effect on that, um, medications can do it, sweeteners can do it. So there's all kinds of things in the diet that tend to disrupt this gut. And when you go on a carnivore diet, a meat-based diet, you, you don't ingest those things anymore. And so the, the gut has a chance to heal up, and then we see inflammatory markers improve, and then we see the autoimmune symptoms uh, get better afterwards. So there's really been like no real negative repercussion on this in, in terms of the leaky gut syndrome that the meat's not actually is doing the exact opposite or is just not causing any inflammation. I think it's causing meat, that leaky the, yeah, the cells the, to open up. The meat is not causing that. And so when you take away something that's causing problems, you know, if I were to tell you, you know, I could say, well, if, if you keep hitting your head and keep hitting your head with a hammer and you get a headache and you're like, I'm taking aspirin all the time. I would say, well, why don't you just stop hitting your head with the hammer? That might be a better solution. And so what we, 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 we do it the opposite way. We just keep taking the aspirin. And so if you get rid of the offending uh, you know, items, whether it's food or other, other environmental problems, then, then people get healthy. And as far as negative effects from the diet, I mean, there are some transitory uh, things when people transition. Some people will struggle with energy. Some people will have digestive issues initially. Uh, some people will have... Uh, so it's sort of this weird, some people's sleep will be interrupted, some people will have some rashes and joint pain. Those are all likely due to possibly, you know, things like oxalates that, are, that, are, that were previously in the diet and now not in the diet and now are leaving the tissues and kind of going into serum and stuff like that. Um, you know, but for the most part, I have not seen really any, in, in, in looking at now tens of thousands of people that have done this diet, I've not seen any people with significant health problems, you know, leaving. Now, some people leave because they're like, ah, I just wanted to eat something else because I was bored. I wanted more variety. But most people, interesting, there's a lot of people that, well, you know, this is the opposite you see with veganism because people go on a vegan diet, they'll get sick, and then they never, ever want to do veganism again. They're like, this ruined me. I'll never do it again. But there are people on a carnivore diet that will do a carnivore diet for, uh, you know, three or four months. They'll feel really good, and then they'll, they'll kind of backslide, and they'll go back to their regular diet. And then six months later, they're like, I'm going to go back to carnivore or they might say I'm going to stay 90% carnivore because it's more compatible with my lifestyle. And I think we see that people once they realize how nutritious and how good animal nutrition makes them feel, they always want to keep that in their diet, which mm -hmm. I think is very, very telling. And I know there's one more pro is just, um, what does it do for like people's looks? Like how do like, you know, somebody's got, even like you're 50 years old and you're a super athlete. You're still an ultra athlete competing, knocking out guys in their 20s and Olympians as well. Yeah, so I mean, I think for many people, uh, it, it helps just with overall body composition in general. I mean, most people will note that they tend to get leaner. They, they tend to find that they can put on muscle a little easier. Some people actually put on a little bit of muscle without even exercising just because they're getting high quality protein. Now, people that are pursuing uh, athletics find that they get stronger, they get faster, their recovery is better. 
Uh, there is some evidence that perhaps it might have some benefits on the skin. You know, we look at what causes aging of skin. One of those things is something called advanced glycation end products. And so when you stop uh, creating endogenous uh, advanced glycation end products, then, then maybe the skin gets better, you have less wrinkling. Um, a lot of people, you know, just feel like, uh, you know, as we get older, our skin gets very thin because we lack protein. You know, as people age, they have a harder time absorbing protein and, and they tend to eat less. And then they just end up, you know, kind of, you know, auto, basically auto cannibalizing themselves. They just start drawing from their own tissues. And we see that a lot of times with vegans. It happens earlier because they start to age in many cases prematurely. You know, they'll, 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 they'll age 10 years in a period of three years in a lot of cases. And so I think a carnivore diet probably either delays that or in some cases actually reverses that. We've seen people where they, you know, like gray, like I used to have a lot of gray hair on the side of my head. And that's, I mean, right now it's pretty much brown. There's a few yeah. dustings of gray, but a lot of people will say their gray hair goes away. And that probably has to do with oxidative stress. We know that oxidative stress is one of the things that causes gray hair. There's some other things that certain mineral deficiencies can also do that, which are probably mitigated with carnivore diet. Eat more blueberries. Just all those antioxidants <laughs> you're missing. <laughs> well, that's you know the interesting thing, and this is this is some of the misconceptions about things like polyphenols and antioxidants. We as humans do not even absorb those very well. I mean, if you eat a bunch of antioxidants, a very very small mm -hmm. percentage of that will actually make it past the gastrointestinal border because we don't have a use for it. And then when it does those polyphenols, all they do is they go to our liver and our, our liver immediately detoxifies it because they're all toxins to us. And what they do is they, they upregulate our detoxification pathways. And so what happens, it's like drinking alcohol. You get a tolerance to that. And so what the argument is, okay, so now you have these liver enzymes that are upregulated to deal with toxins. And so now if you're out in the pollution, you'll be exposed to pollution, but your detoxification systems are upregulated. So now you can kind of more effectively detoxify these other compounds. And so that's probably the realistic benefit of these compounds that we think are so great for us. But they also have negative effects. Polyphenols, for instance, they impede our ability to absorb things like amino acids. And so polyphenols are not, a, not at all an essential requirement. Amino acids are. And so polyphenols block our ability to absorb something that we absolutely need. And so it's like, well, what's better? upregulating our endogenous detoxification systems or blocking essential nutrients mm -hmm. and are there other ways to upregulate our endogenous uh, defenses and yes there are things like exercise so if you just exercise you get the same benefit you get the same benefits as you would eating these polyphenols but you don't get any of the negative side effects interesting it so, seems like we need to be inhibiting certain stresses for our body you know, something like what exercise does prepares our body we put it through a certain stress in order to make it stronger internally and externally and it seems like at least from what you're saying is like sometimes eating these foods yeah it puts our stress levels up like the, in the uh detoxifying for example the blueberries or the polyphenols but yeah our stress levels are up but it's not the things that it's restricting more than it's actually benefiting with simply doing something simple as exercise. Right. I mean, so with exercise, there's not really any collateral damage unless you get hurt or you you you, 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 you run. play basketball you, like me. Well, yeah. Like, yeah, you get an elbow in the face, and then that's a different <laughs> thing. But I mean, you know, generally just moving our body, you know, and, and getting our heart rate up and sweating in general is going to be beneficial. Uh, and, and they do. They upregulate these, these sort of systems. You can eat plants and get that, but at the same time, the plants are going to also – cause problems because some of these foods, you know, while they may, you know, while they may upregulate things, they may block, they compete the absorption of nutrients. They may have problems like lack of alkaloids and other, and, or goitrogens have on our thyroid, you know, so you're eating all these cruciferous vegetables thinking you're getting all these wonderful sulforaphanes to upregulate our endogenous detoxification systems. But at the same time, you're ingesting goitrogens that are, that are causing harm to your thyroid. And so it's kind of like, where's the benefit, where's the risk? And so there's a lot of people out there that they think they're doing a good thing by drinking all these kale smoothies and eating, you know, these giant salads every day. And yes, there may be some beneficial effect, but there's also a negative effect. And then they're like, well, why did I have kidney stones? Oh, well, you're eating, you know, you're eating a bag of spinach every two days. Well, that's why you got kidney stones. And yeah. so, you know, we've got this halo around fruits and vegetables because the epidemiologic data shows that people that eat fruits and vegetables tend to be healthier than people that eat junk food. But it's not that eating fruits and vegetables are super healthy. It's just not eating junk food is really healthy. Hmm. A lot to unpack there. No, just think of the next question. But that would make me want to take me into supplementing. 
And I know uh, back to that cruciferous question too. I know Rhonda Patrick is somebody who you know really pushes the cruciferous vegetables um, and anti-cancer uh, proponents of those vegetables. And I know that's one of the p things that people have against the carnivore diet or it, in the World uh, Health Organization, which is eating red meat or bacon, is that it's going to have more cancer-causing agents than it's going to have positive. And that's I think has to do with the uh, the amount of uh, enhancing the amount of amino acids or proteins that are in the system. And that's going to have a negative repercussion on it. And is what is the, is that something the World Health Organization like actually means, or is that that's something else pushing some other agenda? Yeah. So I mean, there's a there's a lot of ways to top tackle that topic. And so if we just look at like in 2015, the IARC, which is the International Association of Research on Cancer, met in Lyon, France, uh, and they came to the conclusion that red meat is a type or class one carcinogen for processed meats and a class two That's carcinogen right, yeah. for red meat. And, and what they, they based that on epidemiology. And so they had these studies where they would look at giant populations and they say that people that ate red meat were at a 17% increased risk for developing colon cancer, colorectal cancer. And so when we look at population study, 17% is really kind of meaningless uh, because you have to get that number has to be at least 100% before it even meets something called the Bradford Hill criteria before you can start to attribute causation. For instance, when we looked at smoking and, and its relationship to lung cancer, the relative risk numbers weren't 17%. They were things like 2,000%, 3,000%, right? And so when we look at, um, you know, what is causing colorectal cancer, what are the other things? We can look at things like... Uh, Obesity, visceral fat, hyperinsulinemia, chronic inflammation, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, those things dramatically increase your risk for colorectal cancer. You know, inflammatory bowel disease increases your risk for colorectal cancer by something like 3,000%. Obesity increases your risk for colorectal cancer like 300%. Hyperinsulinemia, 300%. Uh, visceral body fat, 600%. And so you compare those things to 17%, which is clinically meaningless, quite honestly. You kind of have to sort of take that stuff with a grain of salt. And if you go on a diet, and this is what happens when people go on a carnivore diet, if you go on a diet and you get leaner and you lose visceral body fat and your inflammation goes away and your hyperinsulinemia improves, and if you have irritable bowel disease or, or, or sorry, inflammatory bowel disease, that goes away. What has that done to your colorectal cancer risk? It's tremendously brought it down by hundreds of percent, thousands of percent in some cases, and you compare that to maybe increasing it by 17%, that's not particularly compelling. You know, the IRC panel, there was a, there was a guy in a Professor David Clurfield who was on that panel, and it wasn't a unanimous man, manus decision. There was a whole bunch of people that said, no, we disagree with this statement. It wasn't like they all said 100% we agree on this. He basically said they basically threw out a whole bunch of studies that didn't agree with their conclusion. They just ignored them. They said, we're not even going to look at those things because we disagree with that. The panel was composed up of a significant percentage of people that were either vegan, vegetarian, or Seventh-day Adventist, which is, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist church is basically a vegetarian church mm -hmm. who has a very sort of philosophical belief that meat is bad for you. Meat is going to cause people to be sinful. It's going to people to cause make them lusty. This is why, like, uh, uh, John, uh, William Harvey Kellogg back in the 19, early part of the 1900s was taking people off red meat and he was, he was, he's doing gentle mutilations on females. Oh yeah. He was, he was doing, doing all the crazy stuff, right? Brutal. Because, because red meat was bad. And this is this religious stuff. And remember that red meat, uh, was demonized since the beginning of the American Dietetics Association, which was established in 1917 by, uh, uh, someone named Lena Cooper, who was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so, but back to the Rhonda Patrick stuff. And so she's talking about the same thing. Broccoli increases for its vegetables. Brussels sprouts have sulforaphane. Sulforaphane given to cells can have an anti-cancer effect. It can, it can raise these endogenous defense mechanisms. That's true. But at the same time, um, we have to realize that these, these foods aren't eaten in isolation. We don't just eat sulforaphane. We eat the whole broccoli. And the whole broccoli has a whole bunch of other compounds in, some of which are particularly deleterious to some other people. Um, you know, the, the other angle people talk about with protein is this thing called mTOR, so the mammalian target of rapamycin. So we know that in uh, sort of very old systems, you know, all the way back to, to, to these eukaryotes and bacterial things, if we, if we 
stimulate mTOR too much, the cells die earlier or they'll get cancer. And we see that reproduced in fruit flies, uh, like worm studies, like nematodes, uh, mice studies, and yeast cells. And so people are extrapolating that data into human data to show that's the case. But it doesn't hold up when you look at humans. You know, in the human populations, uh, we don't see that people restrict protein live any longer. We see, in fact, there's good examples of populations that eat lots of protein, including lots of animal products. Like, in, for example, if you, go, if you Google, and I challenge anybody that's listening to this, Google Hong Kong life expectancy, and you'll see that Hong Kong lives longer than anyone on Earth right now. And then if you Google Hong Kong meat consumption, you'll also see that Hong Kong eats more meat than anybody else on the planet right now. They eat approximately one to one and a half pounds per day per person, and they live longer than anyone else on the planet. And this is seven million people. This is not some blue zone of 20,000 people. Where do they get the meat on that little island? Well, they import it. Okay. They import a lot of it, and, so, and most of it's pork, by the way. Uh, but they eat a lot of seafood. They eat a lot. They eat, they're like the third largest consumer of beef in the world, and they're you know per, really? per capita. You know, Hong Kong's way up there. Uh, so they're eating lots of meat. But the thing about mTOR is, and it's the same mistake we make about anything. You know, we talk about insulin. Too much insulin is bad. Therefore, we should keep our insulin as low as possible. That's not true. We need some insulin. We need mTOR. What do we need mTOR for? We need it for muscle. We have to have mTOR stimulation to to stimulate muscle growth. There is good data that shows that preserving lean muscle mass and maintaining your muscle mass as you age protects you from death. It certainly protects you from uh, disability and dysfunction. You know, as you get skinnier and, and sarcopenic and you lose your muscle, then you become frail, you become dependent, you fall down, you break your hip, and then you die. And so maintaining that muscle mass requires a certain level of mTOR stimulation. And also mTOR is not stimulated uh, in, in a blanket light fashion, you know, you can do certain things like eat, you know, eat animal protein, eat enough lutein, leucine, and then resistance train, and you'll stimulate the muscle mTOR, but you may not stimulate the liver mTOR or the, the mTOR that might lead to premature growth or death. And so it's, it's more nuanced than we're told to believe. So people make a discovery, they say, aha, mTOR leads to aging, therefore we should minimize mTOR in all cases at all times. And again, the body is more complicated than that. And so what we end up is having people promoting, uh, people turning into walking skeletons. We're gonna restrict your calories, we're gonna restrict your protein. We want you to get to as skinny as possible so that you might eke out an extra three years of existence, which hasn't been demonstrated in humans and likely will end up you just resulting in frailty and, and, a, and a poor quality of life. Yeah, I don't think, um even when people want to lose weight, it's not really restricting calories. It's about getting better quality calories in your system, especially if you're exercising after that fact. I know some people don't lose weight right away because they'll drop to maybe a thousand calories. Like I'm just trying to lose weight. I'm just trying to lose weight, but there's nothing beneficial going back into that system to be recycled back in. Right. I mean, you know, obesity is really a problem of malnutrition. It's it's not a, it's not a, it's not a deprivation of calories, but it's a deprivation of quality nutrition. And so we have a lot of people that eat a lot of calories, but they don't take any actual nutrients beyond the calories. And calories are, calories are still a nutrient, we need calories, but we need amino acids, we need essential fatty acids, minerals, and, and vitamins, as I alluded to earlier. And so um, we have to sort of get beyond the, it's all about calories, because certainly calories are important, but we have to realize that we need good nutrition to function optimally. And, and the best place to get that nutrition is, is in the animal source product. It's very clear from, from, you know, looking at the quality studies on animal versus plant-based nutrition and then looking at our own, you know, physiology. I mean, it's, 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 it's not even a contest. And so, uh, you know, you have these, these morbidly obese people that they starve themselves and they, they just become, you know, less obese but, but equally as sick versions of themselves. And so they have to um, provide themselves the, the essential nutrients while they're, while they're losing weight. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, I, I've, I've learned that as I'm not, I'm getting old, but it, when I exercise now, you know, I have to be able to put even like just mobility and movement and functionality and putting your body in all these different positions. So, you know, now I realize if I did all that kind of training when I was playing, it would never hurt, sprain my ankle or broke my ankle just by leaning it over to the sides I'm doing under the table right now or doing just some simple calf raises, strengthening those tendons and ligaments up and down the leg that attach to the Achilles. And that be those things would be a thing in the past. And now, if I do go to any sporting event, I haven't got a serious injury, you know, in years. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, one thing I, I was sort of saddened by, but but also uh, you know, it made me curious. Is we see an incredibly 
dramatic increase in the number of pediatric uh, orthopedic injuries like ACL injuries. You know, mm-hmm. all athletes are, you know, they dread a torn ACL because it can be career ending. And we're seeing it in younger and younger kids. And, and the thought was, well, kids are participating in more sports and they're specializing and they, you know, they do this year round stuff, but that's really not the issue. I think that kids are probably less active on whole today than they are 50 years ago when I grew up or 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So I was, I was out playing every day and now kids, you know, they go down and they, they play their, uh, you know, Xbox or whatever. They I mean, struggle to get a kid to go to 45 minute soccer practice. Right, right. So, so you've got kids that aren't as active and they're still tearing their ACLs like crazy. And so I think it's, it's really comes down to our nutrition as we see a greater and greater reliance on these processed foods, these low quality nutrients, these lack of uh, animal based nutrition, we see higher and higher rates of, of tissue problems. And I think it's just a, it's a direct correlation. We know in animal studies that there's something called the burst point for, you know, tendons. And if we feed an animal a certain amount of grains and oils, their tendons will burst. And, and that's known in the animal literature. And the same thing basically happens in humans. So we have humans that are eating, we're basically feeding humans the same food we use to fatten up cows and pigs. I mean, this is what we, we feed humans as our, as our base diet right now. And it's having negative con- con- consequences, not only to our metabolic health and, and also to our tissue health, which is just a consequence of that. And so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. If you are on a high quality, high animal-based nutrition diet, I think you're gonna be more robust. You're gonna be less likely to tear things. And when you do injure yourself, you're gonna heal a lot more quickly. You think about it, if I cut, if I were to take a, a you know knife and, and cut you across the arm right now, you know, and if I didn't go to jail and all that stuff, but I mean, <laughs> if I were to do that and I would say, well, what do you need to heal that, right? What do you need to heal that cut? Well, you're gonna say, well, what do I need to heal that cut? Well, it's made out of amino acids. It's made out of fats. Mm-hmm. It's made out of vitamins and minerals. It's not made out of cellulose. It's not made out of polyphenols. Yeah. So you need the building blocks to heal that stuff. And so when you're providing that in its optimal form in an animal-based diet and, and not taking in the cellulose and the stuff you don't need, you're gonna heal more quickly. It's funny, I, uh, when I had my kidney surgery, it wasn't that big of a you know, incision, but it was, a, it was a cut and opening inside your body. And I had read up, you know, just enhance the amount of protein after you have a, you know, an open surgery like that in order to heal. So I mean, it, it's all making sense now, but like, even then it was like, I remember in the hospital, they're like, I said, mom, just bring me a bunch of salmon, bring me a bunch of red meat as you can. And I'm in there. I didn't take any of the, what's it called, um, opioids I wanted to give you after surgery and just throw them down. I'm also a savage and just will fight the pain. But I'm just like, well, you ate all this? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to get out of the hospital. Let's go get me out here as soon as you can. And, you know, you know, moving in like two or three days, like it's like it was nothing. It's, they can't even believe it, but it's, it's nothing out of the ordinary. Yeah, I mean, you think about it. I mean, humans probably got cut a lot, you know, back in the day. Mm-hmm. And if we would have, you know, taken a week to heal or two weeks to heal or bled all the time, we probably wouldn't have made it as a species. I mean, I think being on a, on a diet that does it, and we know absolutely in the surgical litter, it's replete with the fact that poor nutrition leads to poor healing quality. The problem is we haven't been able to figure out what good nutrition is. And, you know, I saw firsthand patients that were on a, you know, a low carb diet, even, you know, a ketogenic diet and, and not even with a lot of animal products. Cause this is before I was adding the animal products. And even those guys would do better healing wise because they weren't taking in all the garbage and they were having much less inflammation around, uh, you know, around their surgery, much less pain. And so mm-hmm. I think, and I've heard now from many, many people on a, on a, on a sort of carnivore style diet or an animal based diet, that they take long, they take less time to heal. Their healing is less eventful. It's less painful. Um, so I think it's a tremendous tool. I think I think you know honestly, I think if somebody has surgery, the first thing you should do is go eat a steak. I mean that 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 is <laughs> that is in my view what we need to be doing. Um, that would that would be my next question too because I know a lot of people have asked this too before I had you on the show is should you be supplementing? if you're on something, uh, if you're on this kind of carnivore diet, supplements versus no supplements. Yeah. So I think for most people, the answer is no. Uh, I know that's controversial because if we look at a carnivore diet, you know, if we're eating strictly meat on paper, uh, you know, you're not going to hit your RDA in a number of nutrient categories. You could argue things like vitamin C, you could argue vitamins like, uh, uh, you know, vitamin E, vitamin K, uh, folate, uh, manganese and other things. But the funny thing is the RDAs are really just based on not very good evidence. I mean, they're really, 
Uh, so in 2007, the and real quick, could you tell people what the RDAs are? So the RDAs are the recommended daily allowances, and so that's that's supposed to be what we are supposed to eat on a day-to-day -day basis to, to to avoid vitamin deficiencies. And this was determined looking at uh, population studies. But so in 2007, Institute of Medicine examined the RDAs, and their conclusion was the recommendations are based on the lowest possible level of scientific evidence, which is just expert opinion. So it's basically some guys saying. Yeah, I think that's what we're supposed to eat. So it's kind of some guy pulled out of his butt. Or, you, know, you know, collectively people have done that. And that's what we base all of our nutrition on, these RDAs. And so the, the fact that they're based on such poor evidence is, is that kind still of, on the pyramid thing right there? Well, it's, it, it, it's, it contributes to the, the, the okay. formulation of the pyramid. Like a 2,000-calorie diet. Is, yeah, I mean, if you, if you pull up a pack of, you know, whatever food and you look on the back, it'll say, you know, nutrition facts, and it'll say percentage of RDA, oh, okay, you know, okay. and that sort of stuff. But, again, those things are based on observations in populations that are eating, you know, largely a grain-based diet. And so when we look at a, a typical American diet, which is 60, 70, 70% 70 plant-based, much of it grain-based, it's filled with things like fiber, uh, oxalates, uh, phytic acid, and other anti-nutrients that prevent the absorption of things like zinc, things like calcium, things like iron, things like magnesium. And so the fact that you have to eat so much more to make up for that shows that the RDAs are not equally applicable to everybody. So if I'm not eating all these grains, if I'm not eating all this phytic acid, if I'm not eating all these oxalates, then guess what? The bioavailability for me for all those nutrients that I am eating goes way, way up. And so for most people, they don't need to supplement. Now, there are people that are exceptions that probably do. I mean, there are people that have had like gastric bypass surgeries where they had part of their digestive tract removed and they can't absorb certain nutrients very well and so they have to supplement there are some people that are so nutritionally uh devoid of nutrition they've had such bad nutrition for so long times that they may benefit from a supplement and a supplement can come from the form of things like an organ meat like liver for for instance is incredibly nutrient rich it's got lots of vitamin a vitamin c and several other nutrients in there there are there are ways you can there are ways you can do a carnivore diet on animal products to 100 percent cover your rdas you know if you wanted to and that would include eating organ meats some seafood maybe a little bit of dairy uh and that's doable uh but as a blanket recommendation most people don't need to supplement or certainly don't need to do it long term at least that's been my experience you know some people find it Perhaps like I, I take salt, you know, I'll, I'll put some salt on my food and sometimes before I exercise, if I work out, I might throw a teaspoon of salt in a glass of water and drink and then chase it with a couple of glasses of water just for performance reasons. But, you know, are there are carnivores who will say like, hey, you can't have any salt like that or it's just got to be rich. or some people literally try and say that strict where it's there are a few people that do that. And, you know, I think for some people it makes sense. I don't think it's extrapolatable to the to the entire population. I think, you know, we have to be again at the end of the day uh, to not make this a religion or a dogma. We have to be open minded to say this is a way you can do it. It works fine for many people. Some people find more benefit doing it this way. Anybody that tells you there's only one way to do something is maybe for that person only, but, I mean, it doesn't mm -hmm. apply to everybody else. And Like I said, I don't, I'm not lobbying for the whole world to go carnivore. I'm not lobbying for 7 billion be people to all eat you know, a meat-based diet, which some people try to straw man this argument. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't feed the whole world on seven, you know, <laughs> you know, 10 million people on a carnivore diet. No one is trying to. All we're demonstrating is this is a viable way for many people to eat. This is a very effective people way to eat for many people that are having you know health issues, and it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, one of my last topics I'm going to take you on is because I saw you pose a few things about this, and it was really interesting because I'm really interested in this fact on food psychology and diet psychology about why we eat the things we do. You know, we're talking about we talked about the kind of the beginning of the episode, but. You see this huge campaign these days that meat is, we talk about the World Health Organization, or the World Health Organization or somebody else saying that red meat's a carcinogen. And a lot of these documentaries that are coming out that the amount of um, methane that's coming off cows, whether they're burping or farting, whatever, is, and the runoff is leading towards, you know, this, the world is going to end and there's so much toxins and pollutants that's coming off from these cow, uh, pig farms, especially in North Carolina. I can't see, you know, every few weeks I'll see a report about that, especially if there's a, a hurricane or a flood going through there. You know, what, is there something to be scared of? Is there a negative repercussion of eating all this red meat? Or is, again, what I like to think is like th there's 
it's capitalism. There's people with money, there's people with interests, and you can't let people lean and favor your interests. You have to go make those interests for yourself. Is it as simple as that? Or is there something that, you know, the runoff of these animals, as well as, you know, the methane gas is negatively affecting our planet? Yeah, I mean, so this is obviously a very big topic and a very, very, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. And so let's, let, let's just first say, yes, there are people out there that stand to make a lot of money uh, f for you and I to cut back on our meat consumption. I mean, that is that's absolutely clear. And they have an agenda. They are well financed. They have billions of dollars at stake, and they're going to continue to push that message. And whether it's a health message or an environmental issue, they're going to make that extremely uh, compelling for you to do so. Now, do animals provide any sort of negative impact on the environment? Absolutely, they do. All existence of any industry we have does that, whether it's the energy sector, whether it's the fossil fuel sector, whether it's construction, transport, consumer goods, all of that has an impact. Plant agriculture has an impact on that. Are there things that animal agriculture continues to need to do better? Absolutely, they are. Is it the number one problem facing the world with regard to the environment? Absolutely, it's not. It's not at all. It's not even close. I mean, even the, even the environmental scientists that are talking about climate change, and, there, and, and certainly there are people that don't believe that man's causing that. I'm not, I'm not necessarily in that camp. But even the, 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 the really staunch environmental you know, people that are talking about this say it's not the cows. It's, it's fossil fuels. So if we want to point the finger, you know, we need to work on the fossil fuel stuff. Now, people can pick and choose how they want to positively impact the environment. I've got solar panels on my house, you know. Does that mean I've done enough and that I can continue to eat meat? I mean, that's, you know, that's up to people to debate. But, I mean, I make my own personal decisions on that. With regard to methane, yeah, cows produce a lot of methane. Uh, they're not the leading methane producers in the world. There's a lot of things that produce more methane from that. You know, natural gas industry, the ocean produces more. Termites, rice farming, uh, all these things do. But me more importantly, methane is, a, is, a, is an atmospheric gas that is very short-lived in the atmosphere. So it's only up there for a couple of years, and then it's recycled. Now, if you compare that to carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide goes up. Uh, which is liberated from fossil fuels, it goes up in the atmosphere and is there for thousands of years. And so, you know, it's, it's a much more nuanced conversation. Again, we have this reductionist cow burps, methane goes in the atmosphere, raises potential for global warming potential, therefore all cows are bad. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's just not that simple. And, you know, by going, th this is an interesting statistic. So if every human in the United States were to go vegan and Every single animal in the United States, all cows, all chickens, all pigs, all dogs, all cats, all horses, were to completely disappear, and, all, and it would all happen instantaneously, what would be the net effect on global greenhouse gas emissions? It would make an effect of 0.3% for all of us to give it up completely. So what do you think Meatless Monday is going to do? Zero. It's going to make no difference whatsoever. You know, the, the thought that you're saving the Brazilian rainforest by not eating a steak in, in you know, uh, here in, in Los Angeles is garbage. We only get 0.5% of our meat from Brazil anyway. Most of it's not produced there. In fact, you know, if we look at the rainforest, yeah, yes, they cut down trees. Why do they cut down trees? Well, they cut down trees first because they need the lumber. They're going to use it. Then what do they do with the land? Yeah, they plant soybeans on there. Yeah, but what are the soybeans used for? Well, all the soybeans in Brazil exports, or Brazil produces about 120 million tons of soybeans a year. They export about 80 million of that to China. All of that soybean oil, all that soybeans are converted first into soybean oil for not animal consumption, for human consumption. So we first make it for humans, and then what we do with the leftover scraps that humans can't eat, the waste products, the soy meal, the stems and the, you know, stuff like that, then we feed it to the cows because they'll eat anything. They'll eat, you know, they'll eat grass and bushes. And so it's not that the food is produced exclusively for the cows to eat. They just eat it because otherwise, where would it go? It would go in a landfill. And what would happen if it sat in a landfill? Bacteria would act upon it, and guess what would be generated? Methane. So it's, it's, you know, these arguments are not so black and white. Now, does Brazil need to continue to be cutting down rainforests? Probably not. Is that a problem that the United States can solve or that I can solve by going vegan? No, it's not. Brazil has to solve that problem mm -hmm. itself. And so these sort of plant-based uh, people that are arguing for these, these sort of radical reductions in human quality you know, nutrition and causing people to become sicker, 
is not based on you know real real actionable changes that are going to make a difference in the world. No, you maybe really you really touched on an interesting part of that where how much of those plant based you know crops are actually already subsidized by the government that you know we're actually farming in our own country. What is that a uh, corn documentary where you know the government pays a certain amount? These these two brothers went out there. We're going to buy a plot of land. And we're going to see how much we can actually make by doing a few uh, harvests of corn a year. And well, they already get a set rate. They get a certain amount paid by the government already. The corn is not even uh, edible to eat. It's going to be used to be uh, broken down to ethanol, literally, just like you said with the soybeans and how it's done in uh, other countries. So, yeah, just a, just a lot to, to chew on, a lot to float on right there. But I first of all want to thank you for letting us come into your home and shoot the show. I was real honored to talk with you. And, you know, you, you got me to get one more push to go back into carnivore. At least to get one of those 90, 95 percent ranges. Um, so again, thank you so much for letting us in. And if um, you got any place in particular, you could send some people. I'm going to add stuff in the show notes of where they can get some great reading material. I know Travis did give me a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of stuff uh, back then and recently. But um, yeah, just a, a plug, people. They they can connect to you or connect to your community or the Zero Carb on Reddit. I know it's a great place to get some uh, information. Yeah, so I'm 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 pretty excited. We're going to be launching something called the Animal. It's called Animal Based Nutrition Network dot com, and it's going to bring together uh, ranchers and producers. It's going to bring together physicians and healthcare providers. It's going to bring bring, bring together like health and fitness coaches. It's going to bring together people from the environmental and the ethical side. It's going to bring together people from the uh, political side that want to you know sort of move to to, get, to kind of get legislation to produce or support regenerative agriculture and, and sort of prevent us from having this compulsory plant-based diet in our school systems. You know, like New York City's adopted, you know, Meatless Monday for their 1,800 schools. They've got other places which are asking if, if we would support a compulsory plant-based day for our children in school. Uh, so we're seeing this message being driven, forced upon us. Mm-hmm. And so we need to you need to combat that. And so Animal-Based Nutrition Network is going to be something where we can start to organize and, and form a way to sort of get a counter message because the, the, the sort of the vegan ag- agenda folks have done a very effective job and they're, they're well funded. They've gotten into political positions where they can make these changes and, and there's no real resistance to that at this point uh, that's that's of significance. So this is a start to do that. So that's important. Uh, you know, I've got my book coming out, Carnivore Diet. You know, it's on available on uh, Amazon and Barnes so & Noble. September, August? I think August is when it's the publisher is supposed to come out. So that's coming out. And then, then I've got a lot of social media stuff, which you can probably put in the links. Absolutely. Stuff, yeah. Thank you again, Sean. And everybody, thank you if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching the podcast, thank you so much for tuning in this episode. Again, if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the like. Let me know if you're eating carnivore or if you've tried the carnivore diet. I want to know. I want to reach out and uh, let's see if it's working for you because it does work for me. And it's obviously working for this guy right here. And everybody else, yeah, that's it. The show. If you like this stuff, it's hard work. We're putting this all together. I got Megan over here helping me. We're driving all around town. You can support us on Patreon, but that's about it where you can support us. So the bus is out. See you guys next time. This is the moment uh, for those who...